We study billionaires, and this is episode 38 of The Investor's Podcast. Broadcasting from Bel Air, Maryland, this is The Investor's Podcast. They'll read the books and summarize the lessons. They'll test the waters and tell you when it's cold. They'll give you actionable investing strategies. Your host, Preston Pish and Stig Broderson. All right. How's everybody doing out there? This is Preston Pish, and I'm your host for The Investor's Podcast. And as usual, I'm accompanied by my co-host, Stig Broderson, out in Denmark. And today, we have a really fun guest for you. Uh, his name is William Green. And uh, William, he's got an education from Oxford, uh, which Guy Spear, who we had on our show earlier, also had his uh, education from Oxford. So I got a question for William after this introduction. But uh, he also studied uh, journalism at Columbia University in New York. He's a writer, and I'll tell you, he has written for some top-tier uh, companies like Time, Fortune, Forbes, Fast Company, The New Yorker, uh, The Economist, and he specializes in uh, investing, and he just came out with a brand new book. The name of the book is The Great Minds of Investing, and it has a profile of all the top investors in the entire world, uh, and he sent us a copy of this book, and let me tell you, this is a beautiful book. I think some might actually qualify it as being a sexy book. And for investing, that's a real accomplishment, uh, William, because not too many people can make an investing book look sexy. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, my question for you is, did you know Guy from Oxford or did you meet Guy afterwards? It's a good question. Hi, first, thanks so much for having me on. I'm just thrilled to be here with you. Uh, Guy, I, I did know at Oxford, but very, very vaguely. I, and I actually realized only many years later in a sort of flashback, like 15 years later, I remembered him as this sort of dashing looking young bloke with a, with a sort of red scarf, who I think I, I resented because he was much better looking than me. Um, and then I became friends with him when, um, when we were both in New York, we, we had both left, uh, uh, left London and, and moved to New York. And, and we kind of randomly met and we became friends. And I, what I didn't realize um, until many years later that, is that I was actually one of the first investors in, in his fund, which I, I you know, I, I'm not sure I did it through tremendous due diligence or intelligence. I, I think I sort of intuitively thought he was really smart. And, and I, I think sometimes in investing, we're kind of uh, we, we just get lucky. And I, 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 I've been an investor with Guy probably for 15 years since then. And we've become close friends and, and collaborators on his book. Yeah. So for people that are joining us that maybe didn't listen to uh, one of the earlier episodes, we interviewed Guy Spear. He's the hedge fund manager for the Aqua Marine Fund. Um, he, uh, him and Manish Pabrai, who we're actually going to talk about in this interview, are very close friends. And Guy just gave us one of the best interviews. If you haven't listened to our interview with Guy Spear, you need to definitely go back and listen to that. But uh, Guy told us about William and, and this book that he's been writing. So we've been anticipating this book since around Christmas. We've been really excited to get our hands on it. And then whenever I saw it, I was like, wow, this thing's crazy. Like it is an awesome book. Um, but anyway, we had a surprise for you lined up today, William. Um, Guy was going to dial into this call and just congratulate you and just tell you, you know, congrats on the book. But um, he got caught up in Houston with the storm that they have down there. He was actually traveling on his way to Boston and he got stuck in Houston and he's actually on a flight right now. So he wasn't able to dial in for the interview, but uh, he was totally uh, he, planning on making it. He's here in spirit. Guy has been a tremendous support to me in many ways. And one, one, of, one of the things that's fascinating about Guy that I learned by spending a lot of time with him because, you know, you know I've, I virtually lived with him and his family in Zurich for a while while we were working on his book, The Education of a, of a Value Investor. And one of the things I learned from Guy is this idea that he and a friend of his, Ken Schubenstein, who's a professor at Columbia Business School, had discussed, which is this idea of compounding goodwill. And Guy really lives this way, like yeah. this idea that you're constantly doing things to help people. And so I, I, I think it's a really fascinating twist on the whole idea of compounding money. You, you know, it's a, sort of, it's a sort of more profound version of it. Um, so uh, so he, he's, he's well worth studying, I think. Like most of these investors, he's worth studying as an investor, but also as a, as a human being, because you, you learn stuff about how to live from the, the best investors. That's, that's the thing Stig and I can definitely say is that once we met Guy, he is such a giving person. Like he would not stop. Like it was just like, oh, here's another person that can help you out. And it's like, Guy, like, how can I possibly repay you at this point? And he wants nothing in return. That's the thing that's just so amazing. But 
anyway, let's start talking about your book here. So, William, tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and how you found yourself as a writer um, really coming into this realm of investment. How did you get attracted to the to the writing of in- investors? It's a slightly un- unlikely and unexpected story, even for me, because I, I grew up in England. And as, as you say, I went to Oxford. I studied English literature at Oxford. And I, I moved to New York when I was about 21 and thought that I would be, a, you know, a great novelist or storyteller and would write, you know, beautiful long pieces for The New Yorker and, and would be a sort of artist. And I would get the, um, the business section of the Sunday New York Times on Sunday, and I literally would just toss it out. I, I, I would turn to the book review um, which was really interesting to me. And, and, and I just, I regarded business and investing and money as kind of crass and vulgar. And I thought, you know, these people who just devote their lives to making money are kind of superficial and, and they live meaningless lives. And, and then in my early twenties, I started to invest. Um, I, I had sold a small apartment that my brother and I had owned in London. And so I had a little bit of money, not a huge amount, but I started to invest. And and I started to really study investing. I would, I would read endlessly about mutual funds and the like. And it reminded me somewhat of what had happened to me when I was a kid, when I was a, about 15 at boarding school. I went to Eton, which is this sort of very posh, slightly oppressive English boarding school. And I, I had s- sort of secretly discovered um, horse racing and, and gambling on horses. And I, I set up a betting account at a at a local turf accountant, as they're called in England, in, in Windsor. And I used to sort of sneak out when everyone else was rowing or playing cricket. And I would go to this betting shop and I would bet on the horses. And initially I made money and I thought, wow, this is fantastic because I'm never going to have to work. And then I discovered that actually I lost and I immediately <laughs> stopped betting on horses because I, I wasn't interested in it for the, for the thrill. I wanted to make money by, yeah. by playing this game. And in a way, when I, when I was in my early 20s and I discovered investing, it had a, the same kind of thrill and fascination to me. It was this game. And you thought, well, so if I can be smart and use my brain in an intelligent, thoughtful way, I can actually make money without really doing that much hard work, which I think is what people like Bill Nigren and, and John Spears, who we feature in the book, also discovered. They were kind of... Um, you know, it was almost an excuse not to have to do things like mowing lawns for six dollars an hour. Well, it's a it's a function of probability. I mean, that's what people don't realize is is you go to the track, it's a probability game, like the, your odds of winning. And when you invest in a company, something some catastrophic event could happen tomorrow to that business, and it could go you know completely bankrupt. And that's a probability. It's a real small probability. It's very small compared to like your track racing, but it's still a probability. And I think a lot of people need to respect the fact that there's definitely a uh there's an odds to it no matter how you shake it i I don't care what anyone says there's definitely an odds yeah it's and and it's and it's a game at some level and i think the best investors often are people who don't have any emotion involved in the game they they truly see it as a game and and so then part of what happened to me was that i i started i started to write about investors for various publications. So for example, I profiled Bill Miller for Fortune. Um, I went to the Palmers and interviewed Sir John Templeton for Money Magazine. I would write about um, Marty Whitman and his attempt to find a, a kind of apprentice who could who could match his greatness. I, I wrote that for Forbes. I, I interviewed Bill Ruane, who is the guy who um, Buffett had, when Buffett closed his limited partnerships in, in the 60s, he said, to his shareholders, you know, you should invest with this friend of mine, Bill Ruane, and over the next, whatever, 30 years, Ruane beat the market by something like four and a half thousand percentage points at the Sequoia Fund. So I interviewed this series of incredible investors, and I became kind of fascinated by this question of, of, of what made them special, what they had in common, why this tiny percentage of great investors was able to kind of defy gravity, if you like, and, and beat the market. And and so that became kind of this abiding intellectual passion of mine. But then I would say in the last few years, my interest in investing has kind of deepened as I've got older. I'm in my mid forties now and you become maybe hopefully a little bit more soulful as you, as you reach middle age. And, and I, I started to be interested in these guys, not just as a way of, uh, of thinking, you know, how do I get rich and be as lazy as possible? I started to think, that these guys like Buffett and Munger or Monish Pabra or John Spears or whoever you want to talk about, any of these great investors, they, they're repositories of tremendous practical wisdom. 
you know, they figured out certain things about what works in life and what doesn't work in life. And, you know, they're not flawless. There are plenty of them who've, you know, had terrible marriages and legal problems or whatever, you know, I mean, like all of us, they're human, but I think they've figured out a great deal about how to live successful lives. And so I, I think part of what this book is about is, yeah, how do you, how do you get rich? How do you figure out, you know, ways to get rich? But part of it is much deeper than that. And I, I, I come back and again, again and again in the interviews to questions about things like, you know, what's made you happiest? What's given you a sense of fulfillment? What, what disappoints you? What, when you look back, what do you regret in the course of your life? Um, where do you get your strength in moments where, you know, you're going through the ringer and, and, and life is not working out for you? And, and so I sort of, I, I, I guess I look at investing in a slightly different way to most people. I'm fascinated in it as a financial game, but I'm also fascinated in it there's a kind of microcosm that teaches you about um, how to live if you study and reverse engineer these very brilliant, very successful people's lives. Yeah. I, I also fascinate, William, about how to make the returns yourself. Like a lot of people would look at someone like Warren Buffett and say, I want to replicate what he's doing. I want to, to, to make these returns myself. Or as you as a person, do you think he is probably better than I will be? I will just invest in, in, in Berkshire Hathaway. And then, you know, to sit back, relax, and enjoy my family and my life. One of the things that struck me about Buffett, it's interesting that you, you immediately bring up Buffett as we talk about the greatest investors. The thing that really struck me sort of surprisingly was I, I had always thought Ben Graham was kind of the most important investing mind of the last century. And, and actually what you start to see is Buffett is kind of the most important investing mind, but he... He just has this extraordinary influence. And again and again, I would talk to these great investors and they would sort of talk about discovering Graham and they would talk about Buffett. And, and so it, it, it was kind of fascinating to me that actually it, it may be that the, the greatest influence in the world of investing truly is Buffett at this point and not Graham, who was his master. You know, it's, it's, I had the same opinion. So whenever I started reading and studying Buffett, I immediately went to Graham because I knew that that was his source of or his foundation of investing. But then the thing that I really had an appreciation for Buffett was the fact that he took Graham's uh, basically like cigar butt approach, but he really morphed it using Charlie Munger. I, I know a lot of people know this story, but his ability to basically take that and really kind of change it in a different direction where he was going after great business as opposed to the ones that were kind of dying, I think was what really set him strategically apart from Graham and why so many people got such an attraction to Buffett because he kind of took it from a dark negative way of investing to this really bright and luminous way of investing that had a profound impact on society. And I think that's one of the reasons why so many people make that change and transition. Would you, would you agree with that, William? I, I, it's a very interesting point. I, I, I think it's, I, I think you're right, but I think it's probably slightly unfair to Ben Graham. I, I, I think, I think Graham came up with a couple of very, very profound insights that, that are still as, um, and and that even that is under is underplaying it very significantly. Uh, it, you know these ideas like the margin of safety that he came up with. Uh, it's an incredibly profound concept if you think that that applies not just to investing but to everything in your life. You know the, the, this idea that the, the future is tremendously uncertain, and so you need to build in some kind of margin of safety. And I, you know, I was telling someone recently that as, as I've been teaching my son to drive, if you can call me a teacher of driving, since I'm not great myself. I, I have a 17-year-old son, and I keep saying to him, you know, remember Buffett, remember Buffett. You need to check in, the, in, in, in your mirror. You can't, you know, and then you need to look around. You can't just change lane. You know, you've got to, you, you, you've got to have this margin of safety. And I, I've really internalized that idea from Graham. So I, I, I think there are many very profound ideas from Graham. You know, the idea that you don't really want to be yanked around by the market, that the market serves you, that the that it's it's not your master, it's your servant. And so I, I think there are very profound things that come from Graham. But then, you know, Joe Greenblatt made a very similar point to me that you made about Buffett, about how Buffett, Buffett kind of added this one twist to Graham, which is cheap companies are great, but if you can find cheap, good companies, that's even better. And 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 Joe Greenblatt said to me, you know, that one twist made made Buffett the richest or one of the richest men in the world. And, and Joel was saying that, you know, when Joel went to Wharton, right, and he, 
he had these professors who kept saying to him, you know, the markets are efficient. And just viscerally, he didn't believe it. <laughs> and then um, he, he, he discovered Graham, like many of these investors in this book, you know, it was almost a, a religious epiphany. You know, he discovers Graham and it changes his mind about everything. And he, and he suddenly has this framework of what he described as a sort of very simple framework to see the world. And then he adds a few years later what Buffett taught him. And so he said those, those two principles, you know, by marrying Graham and Buffett, Really, that, that's how he ended up making, you know, 50% a year returns in his first decade as a hedge fund manager. Yeah. Yeah. And, and William, I'm actually curious about your own experience because you said uh, like several times that a lot of the people that were really influenced by Warren Buffett and it was almost like a religious experience that you would have someone like David Winter in the book who is a fantastic investor himself said that it's like religion. Either you believe in it or you don't believe in it. And you, you have people saying, I found the intelligent investor like, you know, they, <laughs> Like really, yeah. right? So, what what is your own personal experience with value investing? Yeah, you're absolutely right. It, it it really is almost like a like a like a religious thing. And and Buffett has always said either you get it or you don't. You know, and if you don't get it, you're kind of never going to get it. And so for me, when I started to invest in my early twenties. You know, I would see, I, I would read these things that would say, you know, you want to have half your money in growth funds and half in value funds. And and for a couple of years, I kind of did that. And in the end, I, I, I got to a point where I just had nothing that wasn't value. I, I mean, I, for the last 20 years, I've only invested in value stuff. And it just, it just makes intuitive sense to me. I, I, I think I'm, I mean, I have not, not, none of the investing greatness of the people in this book, but, but like them, I'm naturally contrarian. I like to go against the crowd. I don't necessarily think the herd is, is uh, you know, has this tremendous wisdom. I understand that indexing is an incredibly powerful thing and that, you know, it might even be that I'd be much smarter just to index. But intuitively, the idea of going against the crowd, being contrarian, buying stuff that's cheap is very, very appealing to me. I think one, one of the things that's interesting to me is that when, when you look at all the people in this book and at most of the great, great value investors, they're, they're kind of iconoclasts. They're, the, they're these mavericks and eccentrics who temperamentally go against the crowd. They question everything. Um, they're kind of deeper thinkers. And I, I, I think, but I think by nature, I grew up as somebody who, who questioned everything. And even if, you know, if you think about the fact that, you know, as a 15 year old, I was sneaking out to gamble on the horses rather than, you know, going, going to play cricket or rowing in England, you know, I was trying to figure stuff out and it may have been kind of roguish, but it was, it was me trying at a very early age to think, so, so how do you beat the system? Uh, you know, by using your intelligence. And, and when I look at someone like Joel Greenblatt or Monish Pabri, these are guys who, who, who are kind of masters of beating the system through, through using their intelligence. And it may be that for, for almost all investors, it's not a smart thing to do, that you're much better off indexing. But I do think there's this, there's this tiny group of investors who who kind of show us the way, who show us that if you're really smart and you get your emotions under control, you can, you can win the game. And that's, that's what fascinates me. And maybe, you know, maybe it's kind of a, mir a mirage, you know, <laughs> you know, that I, I keep chasing after um, this, the, you know, this possibility that I'm going to be that tiny percentage that beats the market. But, you know, uh, over the years I invested with, with Guy, obviously, who's done very well, who's beaten the market by, hundreds of percentage points over the year, over the years. This is Guy Spear. I invested, I, for a long time, I, I invested with Marty Whitman. I had a separate account with Marty. And, you know, I, I did it right after the, um, the tech bubble burst and, and everyone was sort of miserable about stocks. And I set up this, this account with Marty because, you know, he was a, he was a great bottom feeder. He was a great, a, a great guy at buying busted tech stocks and other things like that. And then, uh, and, and the other guy I invested with, who I'm still invested with, is a, is a very brilliant guy who I was introduced to by Bruce Greenwald, the famous professor of value investing at Columbia. And that's, that's a hedge fund manager in Boston, a guy called Andrew Weiss, who, um, who hasn't had a, a losing year in 24 years with his hedge fund. <laughs> and and that, that to me, you know, he kind of saved me during the financial crisis because Guy had a terrible time and, and, and you know, really had a bad year, like many of many of the sort of fairly concentrated value investors yeah. and Weiss made 1%. And so, you know, th this is why I sort of still cling to this idea that, that 
even though there's a hell of a lot of logic to investing in an index fund, actually, you get tremendous, tremendous benefit, you know, by being a, a long term contrarian value investor if you have the temperament for it. And I think we've got to give respect to all these guys in your book and all these people that, that you're talking about, William. These guys are very smart. They have dedicated their life to understanding like fundamental aspects like accounting and just this hardcore, like they are digging in this stuff for hours every day. And I think a lot of people don't necessarily have that respect for the, for the people they're going against. If they really are trying to beat the market. If you're a person who's just like trying to do it uh, like one day out of the week or whatever, and you're just really kind of not into it, I mean, really into it. I I would argue you really do need to stick with an index. Would you uh, yeah. agree with that based on all I, the interviews you've had? I think it's a very important point. I, I think you're absolutely right. I, you know, early early in my career as a finance writer, I I went to the Bahamas as I was mentioning to meet Sir John Templeton, and I you know I was asking him for advice myself, and 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 he said to me, you know, you have no business buying individual stocks unless you're a professional, basically. He said, it's such hard work. You know, you need to be tremendously diligent. And and he said he didn't buy individual stocks anymore at that point. I guess he was in his 80s at that point. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, a lot of people would disagree with this and would say, no, no, I do fantastically by doing individual stocks. But, you know, Jean-Marie Eviard said to me, he doesn't really manage his own portfolio anymore because he doesn't have a team of analysts who he can send out to do to do the research since he's now in his mid seventies, I guess. And he's, he's more sort of emeritus figure at his, at his fund business. Um, Bill Nigren said to me that, um, uh, he said, there are plenty of great investors who, who, who kind of try to go half time later in life. And he said, it's always a disaster. He said, he said, <laughs> the investment business is so difficult that either, either the throttle is fully on or it's fully off. And so, I, you know, I, I think you do have to be very intensely involved to do well. But, but that said, I think, I think there are certain advantages that an individual investor might have, because if you think about it, the pressure that these guys are under, the professionals to perform every quarter, you know, there's tremendous institutional pressure from their bosses saying, you know, look, you've underperformed now for three years running. And how come you don't get this new paradigm of investing in Internet stocks, which is what happened to Evayard. Um, John Yachtman had the same where his own board tried to fire him. And they said, you know, you're, you're no longer investing in accordance with the principles of your own fund. And, and so Yachtman at the time had probably 10% of his fund in Philip Morris. This is in the late 90s at a time when I think it was trading at a PE of six and had dividend yield of about six. And, you know, he's getting fired virtually and, and managed to survive this war with his directors your shareholders bail out at the worst possible time. So if you're an individual investor and you have the right temperament, you do have an advantage in that in that you can stick with it, but but you need an extraordinary temperament to do it. You know, so all these guys are handicapped by the short-term interest of the people that are giving them money. You know, you look at Guy and you look at uh the, he's got he's got a community of people that trust him and are are value investors and understand that it takes time and you might not have results right away, but I think for a lot of these other hedge fund managers, that especially the ones that you know that you have in the that you display in the book, these guys are totally handicapped by the people that are invested with them with their short term interest. Right, and and this is part of the genius of Buffett, right? Is yeah. that Buffett realized that by by having a, a corporation that, uh, and, that that he had captive capital that you you know he wouldn't be subject to people panicking and bailing out. And so I guess that's that's my question. Why do you think more of these guys don't adopt that model? Now, I know Monish Pabrai is going to be doing that this year where he's starting his own corporation, but why are these other guys not doing that? I don't understand it. You know, one of the things that's fascinating about Monish is is that he, he says often, often in life you have the, the best ideas are all out there and yet nobody does it. And, and he said when he started off investing, he... Um, he studied he studied Buffett obsessively. You know, Monish has this sort of obsessive brilliance to him, where he he just sort of he he studies something and and kind of takes it apart, dissects it, and understands it perfectly, and then mimics it. And he said he looked around at, at the mutual fund world, and he said it was just staggering that all of these guys could see how someone like Buffett had done extraordinarily well, uh, not least by having a very focused portfolio. And they would own hundreds of stocks and they would own hundreds of stocks that were overvalued. And so he said, he said, you looked at this and you just knew that they were toast. 
And so I, I, I think it's a really fascinating idea that you can, the fundamental ideas about how to get rich in investing are not that elusive. I mean, we kind of understand that, you, you know, yeah, there are a lot of different ways to skin the cat. You can get rich a lot of different ways, but there are basic tenets of investing that we kind of know work. And yet people continue to, to panic, to bail out at the worst time, to, uh, to buy high and sell low. And so I, I, I think what I came to, what I came to realize is, is that the challenge is as much temperamental as it is intellectual, that you can, you know, this is one of the things that Bill Miller said to me is that dur during the financial crisis, he discovered that all of his analysts who claimed to be um, contrarian value investors were not value investors at all. They were value <laughs> investors so long as it worked. And in, and in the moment when it ceased to work and really ceased to work, when you were getting killed, they suddenly just didn't have the temperament for it. And so I, I think it requires, it, you know, to do the right thing, to, to, to apply investing principles that, that work, not only, not only requires a kind of intellectual understanding, but actually a, a, a sort of wiring to be able to do it. I think uh, the thing that Monish and Warren both share is the fact that they look at things through the lens of, I'm an investor and I'm also a business owner, and they have that business sense. And, and whenever I think you mesh those two together, you get such a better outcome. Uh, and I think that's one of the brilliance with uh, Buffett and uh, Monish. But I want to ex explain something to the audience just so that they understand it in case they didn't understand what we were talking about there. So when we were saying that Warren Buffett, what he's done is he's basically flipped the hedge fund uh, model on its head. So whenever a business becomes overvalued at, in, the, in the hedge fund realm, that's when everyone is giving you their money. And that's when you don't want it because you can't employ it properly. And then whenever the market crashes, everyone wants to take their money away from you. And that's whenever you need it because you're able to buy stocks at really cheap prices. So it's very hard for a hedge fund manager to be successful because they're getting the capital at the wrong times. And so what Buffett did is he flipped that model on its head and he incorporated a business, which... He bought Berkshire Hathaway, and that's a whole other story. But under Berkshire Hathaway is where he's making all of his stock picks. So now if you have a person that wants to sell their stock in Berkshire Hathaway, guess who can buy it back at a cheaper price? Well, Buffett can. He can actually buy back the shares from the people that are selling it at the wrong time. And then if the, if the market takes his company extremely high, he can actually sell more shares on the open market, raise some, raise some cash, and keep it within his company. Um, and so he's basically taken that model and flipped it on its head. And that's why we were asking, William, why do more people not do that? And it gets to a broader point, which is, which is something that Guy Speer discussed with me a tremendous amount when we were working on his book, The, the Educational Value Investor, which is that, that how your company, your investment firm is structured is actually tremendously important. You know, people tend to focus on this issue of, you know, is, is the stock cheap and stuff like that. Doesn't really matter if your if your shareholders are going to bail out at the worst possible moment, so you're not going to have any cash to invest anyway. And this is this is what's happened with with a series of the greatest value investors is that it, it, in these moments of crisis, their investors just panicked and ran. And so B Bill Miller, who I, I'm a great admirer of, who I think really is an astonishing mind, brilliant, brilliant man. Bill Miller found that his assets went from. Um, it went down 90% from peak to trough. You know, he, he oh initially was managed gosh. $70 billion. He, he said to me that that 90% figure turns out to be quite a standard figure. He said that the same thing happened to Bob Rodriguez. I know that, that um, Yachtman um, at certain points had all of the money flood out of his fund. Um, Jean-Marie Evillard during the, um, during the late 90s tech bubble when he underperformed for, for three years in a row drastically when everyone else was getting rich had, I think his assets went down from 6 billion to 2 billion. So at exactly the moment where there's tremendous opportunity, your shareholders tend to bail out. And so this is, this is a perennial problem. And it's, and it, you know, one of the things that Joe Greenblatt has done, which is really fascinating because Greenblatt is, is a game player, is he's trying to figure out how do you create a system where you're not sabotaged by kind of the foolishness, stupidity, panic, of your investors. And so originally what he did, he's done it in a number of ways. Originally what he did was he, he set up a hedge fund that was very, very concentrated. And um, he and his, his longtime investment partner did unbelievably well. And after five years, they returned half of their shareholders' money. 
And after 10 years, they returned all of their shareholders' money. So then suddenly they didn't have to worry at all about their shareholders panicking. So that's a, I mean, that's a very luxurious thing to be able to do, but it, but it was so that he didn't have to deal with the emotions of his shareholders because running a concentrated portfolio, sometimes he would find that in a matter of weeks, he lost 30, 40% of his money and he could deal with it because he knew that the stocks were incredibly cheap, but his shareholders just couldn't. And, and so then he's done another thing more recently, which is a, which is a, a different way to solve the same problem, which is in 2012, he set up a series of, of mutual funds and hedge funds that own something like 300 um, very undervalued stocks. They have long positions in those stocks. And then they short 300 very overvalued stocks. And so what he's trying to do is, is sort of remove a tremendous amount of volatility and, and emotion from the process by having a sort of systematic approach. And he, he said to me, you know, the returns are not going to be as good as the returns of my concentrated hedge fund. But it doesn't actually matter because the shareholders are going to be able to stomach it more or are more likely to be able to stomach it because it won't have that volatility. So I, I think, you know, to be, a, to be a really good investor, you, you really need to figure out this emotional, psychological side of investing, you know, not just, yeah, I, I buy into this idea that value investing and being contrarian is really smart. You actually have to figure out how am I going to respond when my portfolio is down 50% and simultaneously I get laid off because, uh, you know, the business world is imploding too. And, you know, are you still going to be able to be rational? Are you still going to be able to buy? And that's what these great investors have is, is not just the intellectual understanding of these concepts, but the, the kind of visceral psychological strength to, to, to be smart and opportunistic at those moments of crisis. And, and William, I can't help asking, is that also how you evaluate who should manage your money? Is that not by only looking at their track records and their philosophy, of course, but also how they managed through the last crisis, for instance? It's, it's a really interesting question because, you know, how do you really assess this? I mean, you know, it, I mean, think about it. When, when someone goes through a divorce, for example, there have been these studies that show that money managers returns really are affected by a divorce. How, how do you know what your, what your money manager is going to go through? Not, not just a, a financial crisis that they're going to be able to deal with, but, but they might have a divorce, they might have a sick kid. You know, Don, Donald Yackman had this extraordinarily wrenching thing where his daughter had, had a, a terrible stroke and uh, you know, was in, in a locked-in state where she couldn't move anything other than her eyelids. And you know, so how do you, how do you guess whether you're whether your money manager is going to have the, the psychological strength to deal with, with hardship. So I, I've had this debate for years with this very close friend of mine, Jason Zweig, who's a brilliant columnist at the Wall Street Journal, a personal finance columnist. And Jason, who's interviewed more great managers than anyone on earth and is a brilliant mind in his own right, indexes his own money. And I've, and I've always said to him, you know, you're just smart enough to come up with the wrong solution. You know, you're one of the few people who actually could beat the market and, and yet you end up indexing. And he's always said to me, you know, yeah, maybe you can identify the guys who can beat the market, but you know, then they're under so much institutional pressure, so much pressure from their bosses, so much, you know, there are so many human things that can go wrong. And so I, I, I think it's a perennially fascinating debate, you know, that even, even if you pick the right guy, Will he continue to be the right guy? And I, I haven't truly resolved this. And, and you know, we can, we can look back at someone like Buffett and say after all these years, yeah, he was the right guy. But, you know, I, I didn't invest with him 15 years ago because I thought, well, he's already too old. You know, it's, 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 sort, of, it's sort of like when, when I was a teenager and I, the Rolling Stones did a reunion tour and I thought, well, they're all in their 40s. I'm not going to go see them. I, I missed it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and now that I'm 46, I'm like, God, I wish I'd gone to see the Rolling Stones. And, and in the same way, you know, I, I wish I'd um, wish I'd not thought, well, you know, Buffett is, is uh, you know, it's the law of large numbers. He's, he's managing too much money now and he's kind of old. I kind of missed it. You know, so th these, these questions of evaluating greatness and, and riding it and sticking with it uh, are tremendously difficult. Well, I don't mean the boast, but I did see the Rolling Stones. <laughs> now I'm jealous. <laughs>
<laughs> All right. Hey, I'll get in the next question. Um, and they were not as good as what I thought they'd be. So I'm just going to throw that out there. So you don't have to feel so bad. You should have invested with Buffett instead, you know, and skip the Rolling Stones, put, put, the, put the money for the tickets in books, Hathaway B shares. <laughs> You're right. I should have. All right. So um, the question I got for you, I was immediately captivated by the first person that you mentioned in the book, uh, Irving Kahn, and the picture in the book. I love that picture. And your photographer was amazing in this book. He is a very talented individual. Um, But the picture of uh, Irving, he is sitting down. He's very old. And unfortunately, Irving's passed away since the interview. How old was he whenever you interviewed him, William? Irving was 108. He was in the photograph. In the photograph, he's 108, and and uh, yeah, we we really haven't focused sufficiently on my extraordinary partner, Michael O'Brien, who really is the reason why the book exists. Because he 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 started five years ago taking these incredible photographs of of these great investors, and and he started with Charlie Munger, um, and 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 since then he's photographed all these guys like Buffett and Bill Ackman and Irving Kahn and and Joe Greenblatt, and he's just extraordinary, and he has this this kind of ability to, to get very up close to these people and to get them to engage with the camera. And one, one of the things that he does is, is he doesn't talk during, during the photo shoots. He just sort of motions with his fingers, you know, to raise your chin a bit or turn to the right a bit. And so, so I think the, the subjects, whether it's Buffett or Munger or, or any of these guys, they, they see his intense engagement and they're very intense. So, so, so when you look at someone like Buffett in, in his photo, you know, he's looking directly at you and there's a sort of aliveness to him. And, and so there was a particular challenge for Michael O'Brien, the photographer, when he was taking this picture of, of Irving Kahn, which I, I talk about in the introduction to the book, which is that Irving kept nodding off in between the shots. <laughs> and, and, and Irving, you know, he was 108 years old and he was tired and his eyes were starting to fail and his hearing was starting to fail. And, and, um, and his grandson, who works for Kahn Brothers, who's an, an analyst at the family firm, uh, who's a wonderful guy, Andrew Kahn, who's an analyst there, um, was uh, sort of standing outside the frame asking, asking Irving Kahn, tell, tell him about the stock that you bought in 1928, you know, the, yeah. you know or, or the stock that you shorted, Magma Copper, which you shorted during the, you know, the crash of 29. And, and so Irving sort of wakes up during the photo shoot um, because he's telling this wonderful story of the first stock that he bought in, in 1928 and 1929. And so, so it captures sort of the aliveness of this extraordinary man. So I had a similar challenge when I was coming to interview him because Andrew Kahn, the grandson, just said to me, he's too sick, he can't talk to you. And I, I was sort of in despair because, you know, I didn't want to do a potted thing where I went to the clips and read what everyone else had said. And, and so we ended up coming up with a solution which, which, which worked to a degree that I almost couldn't have dreamed of, which is that I, I wrote out a series of questions, probably about six questions, but they were, they were sort of deep questions. They were questions I really cared about. So things like when, when, when you look back on, on, on the 108 years of your life, what are you really proud of? What, you know, what's the key to a fulfilling life and not just, a, not just an extraordinarily long life? And then his grandson, Andrew, took these questions to him and over several days um, interviewed his grandfather on my behalf and wrote down the answers and sent them to me. And, and there was something about it. I got that email and, and you know, usually you'd be disappointed that you hadn't interviewed the guy in person. And I, I was tremendously moved by the email. And, it, you know, w- w- one of the things that he said, I mean, there, there, was, tremendous, there was tremendous investing advice. There, but there was tremendous life advice as well. So I'll, I'll, sh- I'll share both if you don't mind. So, so the first thing I said to him, you know, what's the single most important piece of financial advice you can share with our readers? And, and he said, safety. He said, con- considering the downside is the, is the absolute most important thing you need to learn as an investor. And he said, you know, you need to deal with this before you think about making profits. And, and he, he had this lovely image. He said, everyone's in such a hurry. He said, you know, they can, they can make a horse gallop but can, can they see where they're going? And he, he said, if, if you slow up and you don't take crazy risks and you don't lose money and you, you keep your eye on the downside, you're going to do way better than your gambler friends in, in the long term. And I, I, this to me was a very profound idea because there, for one thing, 
I, I had made one incredibly stupid investing mistake in the course of my, of my investing career. I'm sure, I'm sure I've made more, but this was a spectacularly stupid one where I had, I had invested in a private company that was run by a friend of mine that had incredible technology. And, you know, initially it shot up and I was thinking I was the smartest guy and I felt like I belonged to this ex exclusive community of very, very smart people. You know, was, uh, Goldman Sachs invested in something like 40 times the valuation that I invested in. And I just felt so smart. And then it just kind of imploded. And, and I sort of... I, I sort of did a lot of soul searching about it afterwards. And I realized the degree to which my ego was involved and that if I'd been, if I'd had my ego under control more and I hadn't cared more about impressing other people or, you know, being in with the, with the smart rich set, or whatever, I, I, I would have had a lot more money. And, you know, I, I, I I'm, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a writer, I'm not a hedge fund manager. And so, so making stupid mistakes counts for me. You know, I, you know, I still have to pay for my kids to go to college and stuff. And so, you know, the things that I've done really well over the years were the things where I just quietly invested with value guys and I stuck with it for many years. And so, so listening to Irving Khan, it was like one of those things where, where you hear something that you know already, but when you hear it from someone who's 108 and who's, who's lived through World War II, Vietnam, the, the crash of 29, and, and you hear how he survived and prospered, you think, man, I wish I'd been smart enough to learn that before, but I'm pretty darn glad to have learned it now. The, the other thing I would say, I was mentioning that he gave very important life advice. And this is a recurring theme in the book. We're trying not just to tell people, you know, here's how you invest, here's how you get super rich. You know, I, I want to learn from someone like Irving Khan, what gave you pleasure in your life? What gives you pride? What gives you satisfaction? And he said, look, it's a, it's a difficult question and it's going to be different for everyone. But he said, family is very, very important. And, and looking back, what really gave him pleasure was family, having healthy kids, building Con Brothers, this firm that, that, that's kind of great. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not a huge firm. It has about a billion dollars in assets run now by his son, Tommy, who's also in his 70s. But I... I took that very much to heart. You know, it's very easy to get carried away and think that everything is about is about getting rich. And and you know, you you look at someone like Irving Khan, and he never was flashy. He never was buying fancy boats and big houses. You know, his son Tommy would take him to a fancy French restaurant, and his dad would just order a burger. You know, and <laughs> and the only thing he spent his money on really were books. And so I. You know, when you look at someone like Irving Khan, is he is he the greatest investor? Did he did he build a massive fortune? Did he did he average forty percent a year? I I don't really think that's the measure of his greatness. I think there's a kind of there's a kind of life wisdom that you get from him that that um, that's very very important. Two things that I was uh, I, I first want to talk about your idea that you were saying here uh, about family because. I think everybody knows that deep inside with their in own intuition. I I'm just amazed at how often I ignore my own intuition. And I think everybody else probably does it too, where you know what the right answer is. You don't have to ask anybody. You don't have to read about it in a book. You already know the answer. And I just I, wonder, I, yeah. I asked myself this question, like if I started listening to my intuition more, every time that I know those answers, just imagine like how much more profitable and fruitful we would all become if we just actually listened <laughs> to our own intuition it's a it's a very profound idea and I, I i you know look i started off as a sort of know-it-all cerebral intellectual who felt like you can you can crack every nut with with your brain and and increasingly i've become more intuitive and perhaps less rational and i think i, I you know i'd like to think you get wiser as you become more intuitive and less rational in a strange way and and i Guy Spear said to me a fascinating thing about Warren Buffett at some point. He, he's, he, said, he said that he's pretty convinced that, that Warren actually makes all of his investments intuitively. And that there's, you know, I mean, there's the, you know, Malcolm Gladwell talks about this, right, with thin slicing, that you, you know, you don't really know what's going into an intuitive decision. You know, there, there's tremendous amount of experience and judgment and, and rational activity going on. But I, I went to Howard Marks, who's also really a genius. I mean, Howard Marks has a wonderful, wonderful mind. And I said, I said to him, do you think that's true about Buffett, that he makes his investment decisions intuitively? And Marks agreed. And 
a monk who's utterly brilliant agreed that he basically is intuitive too. He said, he said in his early days, he thought that everything was down to his intellect, that that was, that was how he was doing anything. And increasingly it's intuitive. And so I, I think there's this very profound balance, right? Where you, you want, you want to think as dispassionately and rationally as possible, but you don't want to ignore that message inside you. And I, I, I once spent a lot of time interviewing Jeff Vinnick when he was managing, I, I guess it was after he had managed the Magellan Fund, which was the biggest mutual fund in the world. And Vinnick said that when, <laughs> that he, when he had made an investment in a very cheap stock and it made him physically nauseous to own it, he knew that it was a good investment. And, and, and Soros <laughs> you know, listened to the fact that, that he got tremendous back pain as the sort of signal that something was wrong with his portfolio. And so I, 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 think, I think for all of us, you're, you're very wise to, to be connected to your sort of intuitive sense, while obviously not disabling your, your sort of rational analysis. I mean, you don't want to be in the middle of a financial crisis and saying, yeah, I, I, I just feel good about myself. You know, <laughs> you, want to, you want to be sort of, you know, brut- brutally analytical at the same time. Absolutely. I always quote this thing to my, my kids. There's a, there's a wonderful line from, from E.M. Forster where he says, um, only connect the prose and the passion and both will be exalted. And I, I think that idea of, of the connecting the prose and the passion applies to everything, right? It's, it's, it's the intellect and intuition. It, it's everything, really. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's really funny. Uh, Stig and myself and um, one of the people that writes for us, her name is Nitra. Uh, we all three took a personality test, and one of the things that it does in the personality test is it weighs your sensing versus your intuition. And so we all took that, and it was really funny to see the results. And one of the things I want to highlight is Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, uh, Steve Jobs, those guys all on these tests all sensed very high on the intuition piece of the of the test. And intuition versus sensing is one of the variables of it. Uh, so I just want to throw that That's fascinating. Out. So due to the length of this interview, we had cut it into two different episodes. So make sure that you guys join us next week for the second part interview of William Green. Now we are the part of time in the show where we answer a question from the audience. And I'm really looking forward to this question that comes from Aref. Stig and Preston, thank you so much for everything, guys. Now here's my question. Monish Pepperai in his book highly recommends the little book that beats the market. And he believes if you use magic formula as your sole strategy, you can get good returns. In fact, he uses magic formula to find good companies. When you dig deeper, you find great people like Tobias Carlyle who was on your show. And he believes these strategies only work if you avoid judgment. Ignoring management and past performance is necessary here. I want to know if we can use these very simple strategies and simple ratios and numbers and get better returns in those experts who use judgment. Thank you so much. Aref, I really think that this is an insightful question and I'm really excited about it because I'm really digging into uh, this form of investing right now. Let's just call this systemized investing. So what you're talking about is that you are following the same approach or the formula and that's just how you invest. Now, let's just stick with that for a moment because one of the key things about using this formula is that you need to you know, keep calm and keep investing all the time. So even though you see that the market is dropping uh, and you see that your portfolio is say, dropping even more, you, know, you should still be invested. And one thing I want to bring up is how would your portfolio do if you are following the magic formula? And Joe Greenblatt, he actually talks about that because my perception was that these companies were more risky because it was a smaller company, it's an odd-looking company, and they're they're very, very cheap and usually they have very bad prospects. Um, What it actually turns out to be is that on an individual basis, yes, it seems like they're more risky. There is a bigger chance of a default. But if you look at it you know, as a portfolio, they're actually less risky than the market. So they actually have fewer down years. And just to give you some stats on that, uh, what John Greenblatt found was that when the market is going up, um, this, this is really where you're making your money. Uh, you'll see that increase by 150%, you know, compared to 100% of the market. And then if the market drops, it will only take 95% of that drop. Now, one thing or one general criticism using this approach is, of course, that it's backtesting. So when we're looking at all this and we're saying, yes, it worked in the past, 
do we know if it will work in the future? Um, we don't know. But again, I don't think that that is especially valid when it comes to uh, this form of investing because you could say the same thing with Warren Buffett or you can say the same thing with George Soros. Uh, will he still be beating the market? And we don't know the answer to that. But I think there's a lot of good arguments why this trend should really outperform the market in the future. And the first thing I want to say is that you really find very cheap company. So basically this approach is it's taking the best thing from value investing, which is finding very, very cheap companies. And the other thing is that you don't use your own judgment. And John Greenblatt, he actually did some analysis on that himself, and he figured out that even though people were getting the same list of companies that followed the criteria of the magic formula, if people had the, the chance to look at it themselves and then decide of which companies they want to invest in, they actually underperformed the screen. And that was most likely because uh, they were taking away the what appears to be the worst companies, but incidentally, that was the companies that they were making the best returns. And actually, Joe Greenblatt, he's very, very smart. He tried it himself, and he also figured out that he couldn't beat his own formula. So, yes, I think there's a lot of good things to say about it. Um, but I also want to say that just to follow up on the on the Jack Swagger book we had last time on hedge fund wizards, I think it's very important if you use this strategy that you are very uh, consistent and also that it suits you. Um, I think it, it requires a certain quality for a person if you want to say, hey, I don't analyze anything, I simply look at a formula. I think in times when things are bad, I think this is really hard appro- approach to uh, to stick to. So yeah, that was uh, that was basically my response. But I do want to say one thing though, Aref. If you ever decide to start using this approach, I would be extremely interested in hearing how things goes and what your experiences are. So if you ever decide to do that, uh, please uh, please send me an email. Again, thank you, Riff. Fantastic question. We will make sure to send you a free signed copy of our most popular book, the Warren Buffett Accounting Book. And we are really looking forward to next week's show and the rest of the interview with William. So that concludes our episode for this week. We will be with William Green next week for the second part of our interview. And we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for listening to The Investor's Podcast. To listen to more shows or access to the tools discussed on the show, be sure to visit www.theinvestorspodcast.com. Submit your questions or request a guest appearance to The Investor's Podcast by going to www.asktheinvestors.com. If your question is answered during the show, you will receive a free autographed copy of the Warren Buffett Accounting Book. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. This material is copyrighted by the TIP Network and must have written approval before commercial application. 